Hey scholars, welcome to chapter 5 of your environmental science textbook, AP Environmental Science, looking at biodiversity, species interaction, and population control. And what we're going to start with first is our case study that we just talked about earlier, which is the core case study on the southern sea otter, which is a uh, native species to our coast of, uh, of California. And so are they back from the brink of extinction? Are they still um, in the mix as far as in, in, in being endangered? We're going to take, we took a look at that, and obviously we looked at their biggest thing is about their habitat. Their habitat is very unique. Um, it is based off the rocky shore beach that is located off of the coast of California. Um, and they have been very well adapted to the to the kelp and the the area of the, and the area that they inhabit, and so they were they were hunted a lot for their pelts, very very thick fur, which made really really good for for you know being warm and keeping warm, um, and so they were a hurt a hundred early in the early 1900s, um, and most of them had you know, been, been gone. You know, they were really really on the brink of extinction. Um, again, this is another species just like the alligator that was brought back a little bit had a partial recovery due to. The Endangered Species Act, um, but we're still in danger. Um, and the fact is, because a lot of, a lot of pollution um, off the coast of, uh, of 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 California and the West Coast, and so there there's all there's not any hunting anymore. But there's still boating issues, and as well as um, um, oil spill issues and pollution issues that are really really still um, impacting that species. So why do we care about sea otters? Hopefully, we talked about this before in class. But the ethics of just being a care of, of nature and responsible for the environment. Um, they are a keystone species. Uh, they're one of their main food source is the sea urchin. Um, if the urchin wouldn't, was not you know preyed upon by the southern sea otter, then the kelp forest would be destroyed. Uh, which is that, that they are very, you know that they are a keystone species because they keep that kelp forest um, you know intact. Um, also, they're huge in tourism. A lot of people go out to uh, California and do coastal tours. They do coastal kayaking tours, just looking for the southern sea otter, which brings a lot of revenue for that state. Um, so that is that would that would be lost too if they uh, if those sea otters were gone. So nice little case study about the southern sea otter. All right, so we're going to pick up with uh, with how do species actually interact in nature. And a lot of this might be review for you um, because of what you've seen in standard biology. We'll add a few more things to it and give you some more examples. But we're going to look at the five major ways. And I threw some extra information here as well. But the, the main five that the book talks about is intraspecific competition, um, predation, uh, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. And then I would like for you to ask me, hopefully you've seen this, ask me in class tomorrow, what does amensalism mean? and sapotrophism mean. Those are two extra ones that are in the Barron's book that are not in the textbook, but definitely should know those for the AP exam. So ask me about those tomorrow. All right, so most species compete with one another for certain resources. We call this competition. Whether it's of the same species, like intra-specific competition, or whether it's two different species, inter-specific competition, they're still o always competing for the for one another for resources. Um, one of those things that uh, is kind of a rule or a principle, really, is called the competitive exclusion principle. I want to write this one down. This is a good one. Uh, it says no two species can occupy the same niche even if they live in the same ecosystem. So they could live in the same ecosystem, they just can't serve this, the same specific role. So for instance, I have my you know, Megatron jersey on for, for representing my Lions today. Um, you know, first of all, it's the same thing as, uh, as for fantasy football players, right? You can't really have one, you know, more than one person that really, really occupies that role well. So if this guy's a wide receiver, which he is, um, if there was a person trying to do that same job, only one of them is going to get the starting job. So that's kind of the, the kind of the, the, the theory behind competitive exclusion principles that really no two people or two organisms can really do the same job for the ecosystem. Um, one's going to outcompete that one, which is why we call it the competitive exclusion, excluding one of those people who is in competition with one another. That's just a, a neat, decent example of that bringing in some fancy football for you. Um, most uh, consumer species feed on live organisms of other species. We call this predation. Um, and predators may capture prey by a number of different things, just by walking, um, you know, by, by slowly moving along and getting and consuming others. Um, like, for instance, I guess a, I'm trying to think, for example, maybe an, an, ur an urchin or, uh, or something like that, that would be slowly moving along, play, preying upon small organisms. Um, just by swimming, great example is the baleen whales, um, the ones that are literally feeding on the krill. Um, just swimming along, mouth open, taking in those uh, those organisms as they swim along. Um, flying, another one is bats. You know, bats fly along. They're they're preying as they're swooping through the air, preying on moths and things, um, or different insects that are flying around at night. Um, pursuit and ambush. This is one that would be a great example. Is the the tiger? 
Um, you know, they, they hide, they, they actually use camouflage, which is the next one down, um, to get close enough to their prey where they can actually then, you know, surprise them, ambush them, and attack them very, very quickly. And a lot of animals use that, that, that fourth and fifth bullet together. They use camouflage to get that, that, that competitive edge to get close enough to them to actually ambush the prey. Um, another one's chemical warfare. And then some prime examples of this, anything that is venomous um, would be a great example. Um, like, you know, venomous snakes, you know, we talked about them here in class, the ones on our herp survey. We've talked about the timber rattlesnake, um, eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the, um, what else did we say? The pygmy rattlesnake, the copperhead, the cottonmouth, um, even the, uh, the coral snake, all six of those are, are venomous species that could be dangerous. And again, they use that venom to, to either, either stun the prey or kill the prey right off, or at least have them, you know, less, less spotting chance to, to, to get away. Um, or flee, and so they'll use chemical warfare to their advantage to capture prey. So those are just a few of the, the different, different uh, I guess, attributes or, or adaptations that organisms and specifically predators have made in order to, to, get, to get prey. Um, and on vice versa, prey have, you know, have, have tried to adapt um, in many different ways as well to avoid being captured and consumed. And they use camouflage as well, like moths on the tree. We talked about that earlier. Um, you know, looking at uh, at evolution and how the uh, the peppered moth blended in with the tree that's camouflage, trying to stay clear, you know, and hide from predators. Chemical warfare, um, you know, lots of different types of chemical warfare. Like for instance, toads. Um, go back to our herp survey. We haven't seen many toads out there yet, but you know, maybe we will eventually. Um, and the toads literally have this thing called a parotoid gland. It's right, right, right about the side of the head, and uh, they use that with their if they are preyed upon, they actually secrete a mucus that very tastes very foul and also can cause upset stomach. Um, and so that would be an example of chemical warfare using poison to secrete. Hope that the predator is kind of, you know, doesn't like the taste of it very much. Let's go of the toad and it hops off to safety, which happens quite a lot. Um, warning coloration. Um, anything that's brightly colored in nature uh, usually means poison, like uh, poison dart frogs. Again, they don't use the poison to kill organisms. They just use it to defend themselves. Um, if they're, you know, touched or, or something, if they're just touched, they can actually... But poison can move through their skins, or some of them are, you know, just by eating them or licking them, that could cause major, major problems for that predator. Um, mimicry, another example is mimicry, one of those that actually mimics or kind of uh, acts like something else. Um, I think the book gives you this example, which is uh, this one, the foul tasting monarch butterfly. Um, it has a mimic that actually has a viceroy, which the viceroy looks exactly, I wouldn't say exactly, but very, very similar to the monarch butterfly, same pattern, same color. Um, but it is not um, as, as, as dangerous or poisonous as the monarch. Um, so therefore, they mimic one another because the birds realize that they, they might eat one of these ahead of time. And they don't taste very good. They see this organism that maybe it looks very similar but doesn't have the same um, adaptations that, for that poison. And it doesn't get eaten because it looks very similar to this one. So that's just an example of mimicry. Uh, other ones are deceptive looks. This is a great one. I think I have a picture of it in my classroom. If you take a look around the room, I'll be able to find it. Point it out to me if you uh, if you see it in the classroom. It is basically a caterpillar that looks exactly like the head of a snake, which can be kind of scary for some things. This is another one, the IO moth, that actually um, has looks like if it's up against a tree, looks like owl eyes. It kind of spooks off and kind of uh, you know defers uh, predators. And that's I guess in deceptive behavior. Um, I'm trying to think like a walking stick. Um, I guess that's still camouflage. I'm trying to think of a deceptive behavior. Oh, I got a really good one. Uh, the uh, the hognose snake. The hognose snake, which is actually native to North Carolina, has when it, when it feels like it's getting attacked, it literally flips over on its back, puts out this extreme nasty odor, which would kind of go back to um, we'll go back to this one with this chemical warfare, and it literally. Um, stenches and acts like it's dying, puts on this big show like it's dead and it's just nasty and it's sick and it's dying. And then that kind of like deters the predator from actually going, eh, that's not that, doesn't smell that great. And it already looks, I don't know if I want to eat that. It's pretty gross. Might not, I could get a disease from it. So it actually deters the predator that way. So that's a deceptive behavior that it does. Um, another one we saw, or we've seen actually in our herp study a few years ago, was the, was the, uh, the corn snake. The corn snake, I and mean, a lot of snakes do this actually, um, one day we actually pulled up the board, there was a corn snake there, and it actually mimicked a rattlesnake. It literally vibrated its tail against leaves to make it sound like a rattle, even though there was no rattle on the tail, obviously, we knew what snake it was. But it was trying to mimic that behavior of something dangerous, so that maybe the, that, that predator would leave it alone. So just another example of a deceptive behavior. All right, science focus. Uh, why should we care about the kelp forest, which is obviously what um, our southern sea otter 
uh, lives in. And again, this is a very, very diverse marine habitat has, is one, and is only found in certain areas of the world. Um, there are major threats to kelp forests. Um, one of them is sea urchins, which again, like we said, that, that, that is why the sea otter is a, is a keystone species, kind of keeping those sea urchins in check because they like to feed on them. Um, lots of pollution from, uh, from water runoff, um, especially from those cities that are along the, uh, the west coast, and even global warming. The change in temperature um, yeah, causes, poses problems with their, uh, their food source as well as from their own habitat. So those are, uh, again, global warming could actually hurt the kelp forests, not only for the, for the sea otters, but for the entire ecosystem itself. And this is just a look at one of those threats, the sea urchin. All right, predator and prey species actually can drive each other's evolution. Obviously, you saw the different adaptations that both of them had to try to outcompete one another um, to survive. And one of those is such an intense natural selection pressure between predator and prey that actually leads to them co-evolving, which is called co-evolution. And one of our prime examples that the book gives is the, I'm going to try to pronunciate this, this is German apparently, I had a German exchange student a few years ago that told me how to pronounce this and I'm still not good at it, the Langerhorfledermoss bat hunting a mouse. That is our, our co-evolution example today. And actually the story behind this one is that um, over time uh, the moth had developed very, very unique antenna for sensing things. Um, and so what happened was, over time, this bat didn't have nearly as large viewers back in the day as far as evolution is concerned, um, and the moth actually got better at sensing the sonar of the bat. The bat would send out a signal, the moth would pick it up with its antenna, and it would literally, its adaptation was to fold its wings and drop down. So as soon as it felt it, it folded its wings, and by that time, the message it got back to the bat, the bat swoops and misses the moth. Well, over time, they say through natural selection that the, that the, moth, that the bat... Obviously, it's the larger the ones, the larger the ears of the of the bat, the better adapted it would serve, it would survive because it would pick up that sonar faster. Um, it'll be able to make the correct movement through the air to capture the moth. So eventually, because the antenna, uh, well, the adaptation from the moth to outcompete the the bat of the antenna was better at sensory and folding the wings, the moth or the bat, excuse me, over time through uh, through uh, natural selection got larger ears, and that's why it's called. This is actually what I'm saying: the long eared. Bats is basically what it says in German. I was I had a translation from my foreign exchange student a few years ago. Um, some species actually feed off other species by living on them. This is called parasitism, um, and you've obviously seen many parasites. You know mosquitoes, um, you know lot ticks, you know all these different types of parasites that are literally using a host to feed off one another. Um, and actually, there are some parasite host interactions that may lead to coevolution. So, for instance, the cowbird. The cowbird um, is a larger bird. Um, it, and it doesn't, it, it, over time it has used, it has figured out how to use its host in order to kind of help it not even be a, be a very good parent. Um, so what happens is this cowbird literally will fly into a nest while the mother is, a, a mother of a different species is gone and lay her egg in the nest. Well, if the cowbird is a very, very large bird, most of the times that it, the, the most of the species that it lays its egg in are much smaller species. So what happens is when the egg, then the mother of the other species doesn't really recognize, they don't have a very good sense of smell. That is an old wives' tale. You know, if you, they always say, don't touch the babies if they fall in the nest. The mother will smell you and never touch it. That's not really true. They have very poor olfactory nerves. So what happens is the mother comes back, lays on, on, and, and, and incubates both her eggs and the cowbird egg. And then what happens is all, you know, the cowbird egg usually hatches faster or at the same time the cowbird maybe is much larger. So, you know, the one, the bird, the baby bird who is closest to the mother has the biggest one closest to getting the regurgitation from the mother gets fed first. So eventually the cowbird literally outcompetes most of the babies of that nest of the native, uh, or sorry, of the, of the bird, the host bird. And then the cowbird baby lives on, leaving a few, obviously, baby babies that will, will survive, but not nearly as many as that would normally. So that is the cowbird interaction. And, and the reason why I wouldn't want to just outcompete all of them is because then there would be no more species, no more host species to live off of. So that's kind of that, pose, that parasite host interaction. This is a few other examples. This is a mistletoe that is overgrown. We have this all over North Carolina. It actually is a parasite. It literally will... Um, Kind of feed, use the use the the, the 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 trunk of the tree, the roots tree, and literally burrow inside with its roots, um, as well as I'll, I'll compete it with photosynthesis and eventually kill off the tree. These are also these are not leeches; they are called sea lamprey. They are all over 
um, the, uh, the, the Michigan lakes, the great, Mich the great lakes of Michigan. And they literally will, if you see the hole right here, literally like a, like a bunch of little knives kind of saw into the side of the fish and then just really suck out the juices um, over time. You can see there's two of them actually attached to this one. And this fish will survive for quite a long time, but if too many sea lamprey actually t team, up, team up, you know, not on purpose, but on accident, on one fish, that fish could die, which is actually causing a big problem with this species, which is the lake trout in, in the Great Lakes. All right, another interaction is where both species benefit. Obviously, the last one was where one benefits. Obviously, the other one was harmed. Mutualism is where, you know, they're both benefiting. They're both getting something out of it. And this is called a nutrition and protection relationship sometimes. You see this a lot. Somebody's always getting fed. Somebody's getting something else, usually. Um, one of the examples uh, where both of them get something is the gut inhabit in inhabitant mutualism, where literally this happens in cows, where bacteria will literally go in, help digest the cellulose. So they obviously have a lot of grass. We know about us. We don't digest cellulose. while we poop out corn. Learn that in biology, hopefully. Um, but what happens is the bacteria inside the stomach of the cow literally help digest the cellulose in the plants that it's eating. And that allows for better digestion, better nutrient absorption, and then so the organ both organisms are getting things, the bacteria are getting fed by breaking things down, and the, the, the bigger host organism, the, or, uh, again, the cow, obviously is getting um, some help better with di the better digestion. Okay. So those are a few different types of examples of gut and habitat mutualism. Other ones are like the ox peckers and the black rhinos. Ox peckers getting, you know, t picking the ticks off of, or the mites off of the, the rhino, which is hurting the rhino slowly over time. Sometimes they also will be uh, callers. If they see danger, they'll, 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 they're obviously perched up higher. And this guy's while he's feeding, they'll yell out something if there's danger nearby. So they're both getting something in return, usually bird-free meal, uh, maybe a little bit of protection for the rhino or, you know, protection against at least, at least uh, um, parasites. This is the uh, clownfish and the sea anemone, the prime example you've seen in biology where, um, you know, the anemone actually feeds off of, you know, free-floating things in, uh, in the environment. And obviously the clownfish will eat things, not eat all of them, and the rest of them will be absorbed by the anemone. And also it gets uh, protection because a lot of organisms get stung by the anemone, so the clownfish gets some protection as well. All right. One other one is commensalism, where one species of benefit and the other one is not harmed. A great example are epiphytes, and an epiphyte looks like this. Um, this is a bromelade, uh, which is a type of flower species in the rainforest. It literally roots on the tree trunk without burrowing in the tree trunk. So actually, these are very, very unique uh, plants that are very beautiful. A lot of them, like orchids, are a good example as well, um, that literally will, will root on the outside, absorb moisture as the water flows down the tree, but not really hurt the tree that it's on. I'm just kind of use it as an anchor in order for it to grow. So that's a really good example of commensalism, as well as birds nesting in trees. You know, a bird finds its home in trees, you know, builds the nest, tree isn't really being harmed, which is, you know, just chilling there, and the bird is getting a free protective home from that. So that ends uh, section 5.1. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.